Hello, Sats fans, Swan fans. Welcome back to Swan Signal Live. This is episode 70. We're getting up there. We've got Greg Foss and Larry Lapard here today, together for the first time, talking in public about Bitcoin and macro and bonds and finance. It's going to be an absolutely fire episode. Before we dive in, a quick word about the sponsor and producer of this show, Swan Bitcoin. Swan is the safest and easiest and fastest way to get to stacking sats uh, on the market, in the world. You can go from zero to Bitcoin in about five minutes. It's an awesome experience. You can share this with your family and friends. Just grab their phone and get them started at swanbitcoin.com. Within five minutes, they'll have their first sats. It's a really cool experience. Grab your referral link before you do that. Join the Swan Force. If you're not on the Swan Force already, join 9,000 other Bitcoiners getting paid in sats to recruit new Bitcoiners. It's a really awesome uh, program. It's 25% of Swan's fees for a year. We've got 9,000 people stacking meaningful sats. It's pretty cool to watch. Um, also check out Swan Private if you're looking to make larger purchases and you want a uh, an experience where you have a dedicated representative you can call on anytime to answer any questions of, about Bitcoin. We put out a monthly report that's amazing, 50, 60, 70 pages of great analysis, stories. We also have a monthly webinar for our Swan private members and many other benefits as well. You can go to swanbitcoin.com slash private to get started with Swan private. And we have recently launched Swan Advisor Services. I'm really excited about this service. Andy Edstrom, the author of why buy Bitcoin uh, has joined the team to run Swan Advisor Services. He's still the only financial advisor to have written a book on Bitcoin, and it is a fantastic one. If you have not read it yet, definitely check it out. It's a good one to share with family and friends who are looking to invest as well. Swan Advisor Services is a service for advisors, just like it sounds, so they can help get their clients into Bitcoin. We are the only Bitcoin only uh, advisor service out there right now. And of course, I think Bitcoin only is very important. It's the only true investable asset. It's the only true player on the global monetary stage in the cryptocurrency space. I think everything else are penny stocks, our casino gambling. So when it comes to investing seriously in uh, for the long term, uh, Bitcoin is the only way to go. We are laser focused on it. We provide world class education. We'll teach you and your family and friends what's going on here. OK, so Part of that world-class education is shows like this. And uh, we've got Greg Foss. Let me bring him up here. And Larry Lapar, gentlemen, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you both here together to drop some uh, knowledge and, and some fire. Larry, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for including me. And I'm, I feel really honored to be next to my, uh, my brother, Greg Foss. I uh, have a lot of respect for what he's done. 100%. Greg, welcome back, man. It's great to be back, Brady. Thank you. And uh, Lawrence, uh, I'm going to call you Larry from now on, but at Lawrence Lepard is a must follow uh, only because he's a solid risk manager. But uh, more importantly, I met him down in uh, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire this summer, and we've quickly become uh, brothers from another mother. And uh, I, I love it because uh, we're, we're going to take the We're going to win this war. Yep, we are. It's a good thing. Yeah, the battle is on, and uh, we are going to win. We have truth on our side, and just uh, math, as you, as both of you guys like to say, math is on our side. All right, uh, Greg, we're starting with you. I'm going to kick it over to you because you teased uh, some some knowledge, an exclusive to drop here today of uh, something you learned in Miami. So let's just get to it. What do you got? So I was uh, down in Miami uh, for a market disruptors uh, event. Uh, hosted by Mark Moss. And it was uh, not a Bitcoin only event. Uh, there were a number of great Bitcoiners there. Uh, Robert Breedlove, Alex Fetsky, to name two. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, I uh, just met a diverse uh, bunch of folks who all care about changing the world. Um, and now look, that's not what I wanted to share with you. That's that's going to be okay, Foss. That's uh, touchy feely. What do you really what can you really tell me? Uh, I also met my good buddy, uh, Jose Lemus from uh, Ibex Mercado down there. And uh, he is the in charge of the merchant solution for the Chivo wallet for the El Salvador, uh, the El Salvador platform. And they are crushing it. Okay. And they're crushing it. They are growing 3% per day. Okay. Not Ooh. per week, 3% per day. And that was just tweeted around. I'm not taking anything out of context. 
the more exciting thing is the types of uh, feedback they're getting from people as well as the other jurisdictions that are interested in their solution. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'll go one step farther, including the great city of Miami. Okay. So the mayor in Miami has adopted it. The city of Miami is full of very, very vibrant Spanish Americans, Latinos. And let me tell you, uh, Bitcoin is an exciting solution for a lot of the problems they deal with, including, you know, the, a lot of the Latinos that are there, uh, wrestle with the Western union problems with their families that are back home. Um, yeah. I'll just say that, you know, you can embrace the technology and think it's the greatest thing in the world, but if no one uses it, um, it's not going to be a, uh, a huge success. Everyone can stack and hold and that's all good, but there's also people there's, I'll remind you in El Salvador, there's 4 million people that do not have a, a bank account. Okay. Globally, there's billions of people that don't have a bank account, but they do have an iPhone. So, you know, the solution has to come on all uh, at all sides. Uh, the merchants, and, and this is going to summarize with one uh, story here. As you guys may or may not know, I'm, uh, I'm a uh, bar owner in Montreal for 25 years. I've owned some Irish pubs and uh, we're not bad. Okay. First of all, uh, restaurants are a tough business and we, we are pretty good at uh, our operations. We make about a 14% EBITDA margin. Um, which is decent in the restaurant business. Um, but when someone pays with a credit card, the visa automatically takes two, one and a half to two and a half percent of sales as their merchant fee. So two and a half percent out of 14% uh, percent is a meaningful reduction in our EBITDA margin. What do you think visa fees or merchant fees are in developing economies? And I'll answer that for you. Eight percent. So imagine you're a really good operator in the U in, in Central America, and someone comes in and uh, decides to pay with a credit card, and you're good and you're making fourteen percent EBITDA margin. And someone takes out their credit card to pay. All of a sudden, your EBITDA margin's been slashed in half. That that's that's a horrible situation for a very tough business. And Bitcoin and the Lightning Network solve this, and at such a beautiful and rapidly expanding rate. I'm going to use it in Montreal. We're not third world, but hey, two and a half percent out of a 14% EBITDA margin. Uh, you know, that's, uh, those are, what's that line from, uh, from the, the two guys there, Matt Damon. And uh, those are real something. Those are real bananas or something like that, right? Look, it, it, it matters guys. And it's happening. And that's how you have to measure it. How about them apples? How about them apples? Yeah, yeah. that's what I was looking for. How about them apples? <laughs> Glad to be here for you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Larry, any any uh, reaction to what Greg laid down there? No, I just think it's great. I mean, I, yeah. I, I was not aware. 3% a day is pretty impressive. And I wasn't aware of the numbers that were going on um, in El Salvador. I, I knew Jack Knowledge was there. And I, I'm super pleased. Of course, there's also been the talk about Brazil and other people going in that direction. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a force of nature. And it's inevitable, in my view. So I... I you know, and, and the, the transmittal business is such a fabulous business and such a fabulous app for Bitcoin because, you know, these unbanked people have been just getting ripped off by the financial system. I mean, just grossly ripped off. And and this solves it, you know, uh, Steve Hankey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. and, and, you know, of course, there are a lot of people who have a vested interest in the system continuing the way it is because it benefits them. But uh, tough, tough darts. That's not what's going to happen. So. So bottom of the bottom of the cancel on effect pyramid. Um, yeah, it's all good. And it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Well, there was a tweet, little thread. Uh, Greg was promoing the show this morning, and Sailor weighed in uh, on a tweet. So I'm going to go ahead and show this on the screen, and I'll just re uh, read it quickly for those who are listening on the podcast. Um, so Greg says Lawrence Lepard is a very smart risk manager. We have far greater concerns than gold crowd. Gold is ten trillion dollars. Bonds are four hundred trillion. Gold is far better than bonds. Bonds are fiat contract programmed to debase. Sailor responds, uh, who have, who is of course the CEO of MicroStrategy, uh, fighting the war for sound money with a portfolio allocation of fifty percent gold and fifty percent Bitcoin is like equipping half your army with modern armor and aircraft, and the other half with ancient swords and spears, because I read in a book that we used to fight that way, quote unquote. And then uh, Larry responds, not entirely correct. The war for sound money involves abandoning fiat. 
first and foremost. Some are not ready to buy Bitcoin for them. Gold, despite its limitations, is a smart choice. Not everyone can be a brilliant MIT guy and handle 50 to 84 percent drawdowns. Um, so that was a nice little exchange. Larry, I want to pass it over to you and explain. Yeah, I, mean, maybe, I, have, maybe, I, yeah. I have enormous respect for Michael Saylor. I mean, he you know, he eventually caught up with us. I mean, you know, Greg and I were buying this thing in, you know, 2013, 14, 15. And a couple of years ago, he decided to buy it. And he's, he's like the guy who's not a new toy. You know, he loves it. And it's the only toy in the world. I mean, I often laugh that, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners, you know, act as though they invented sound money. And, uh, you know, some of us have been at this fight for a bunch of years. And, and that's, you know, I'm not trying to claim that we have some superior standing as a result of that. I'm just pointing out that the sound money battle has been going on for a while. And the notion that gold is not sound money, it may be, it may be inferior to Bitcoin. I, I suspect in the long run, it, it will be, and it'll get demonetized. But, you know, I caution to say the long run, and it's not going to happen instantly. Um, and so, you know, this whole notion that it's, um, that it's an instant event uh, from a risk management point of view and a money management point of view, it just doesn't make sense. And not just because I have a legacy gold mining fund business. I mean, you know, if, if you're in the fund management business, um, you know, and you have an 84% drawdown, guess what? You're out of business. And so, you know, Bitcoin has got more alpha than anything else in the world, more asymmetry than anything else in the world, but it also has more volatility than anything else in the world. And so some people, you know, I mean, I, I feel sorry for the people who, you know, for example, were talked into buying Bitcoin and, you know, at Thanksgiving in 2017 at 17,000, I was buying it there too, you know, and then it subsequently went to 10 and then down to three and a half. Of course, I was buying more. And a lot of the people who were talked into it didn't understand it, hadn't thought it through. You know, they blew it out, right? Oh, God, I, you know, another investing mistake. Here we go. I'm going to sell this damn thing, right? Well, you know, and obviously that was the wrong thing to do. But my point is not everybody can handle the volatility, you know, and some people haven't even come to the sound money story. I mean, they're, they still believe in fiat. They still believe in bonds. They still believe in these overvalued stocks, which are only overvalued because interest rates are zero. And so, you know, we got to bring them away from fiat. We got to bring them away from bonds, bring them away from stocks into sound money. And, you know, in a way, I mean, OK, so, you know, maybe uh, maybe Bitcoin is heroin and, and gold is the gateway drug. It's marijuana. You know, you, you got to get them, you got to get them started on this drug, on the sound money drug. Right. And, uh, you know, gold and silver, are a decent place to start. Are they going to get crushed by Bitcoin? Probably. But, you know, that I mean, you know, I know people who will never buy Bitcoin, at least not in the next five or 10 years. They are just too much against it and too afraid of it. And, you know, understandably so. I mean, they haven't taken the time to study it. They're not likely to take the time to study it. But they do understand that, you know, money is being constantly debased and that, you know, they have to protect themselves against it. And that's why they're buying houses. And, you know, we're seeing Gresham's Law and Housing. And, you know, another good alternative is, is gold and silver. So... That's the point I'm trying to make. And I think that some some Bitcoiners don't fully understand that, you know, this monetization doesn't happen instantly. It's a process. You know, there are six billion people in the world. There's five thousand years of history. You know, Bitcoin's been around for 12 years. You know, I mean, in the earlier days, I mean, I was very concerned about the forks. I mean, which one was going to be the real Bitcoin? And that's gotten resolved. But there'll be other things that will come up. Right. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, everyone has to make their own choices. And if people want to be 100 percent zero. Great. But, you know, I don't think it's fair of them to, without full warning, try and shove everybody else into that allocation, especially people who don't fully understand it. Because if somebody who doesn't fully understand it shoved into that allocation, you have a 50 percent drawdown. They're not going to be prepared to handle it. And they might do the wrong thing, which would be to sell it on the drawdown. Right. So that, that's the point that I try to make constantly, that there's room for both. And everybody should pick their own weighting. By the way, I mean, I you know, I started off a lower allocation of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's done so well, I haven't sold any that it's become a pretty meaningful allocation. Perhaps eventually it'll be the only allocation. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'll sell the gold that I have, but you know, it might end up that I am, you know, right now I'm personally about sixty percent Bitcoin, forty percent gold and gold stocks. You know, a couple more turns and that might be a different number, right? And it wasn't always there. I mean, I, I was a much lighter weighting of Bitcoin before it went from. You know, six, seven thousand to sixty thousand, right? So as long as you don't rebalance, it's uh exactly. it's gonna be, exactly. it's gonna be 90, 95 percent. Uh -huh. probably uh -huh. I, I don't I don't dispute that. But what I do dispute is the notion that gold is gonna go down and that gold is dead. I mean, let me just give you the math on that. I've said this many times. There's four hundred and fifty trillion dollars of fiat assets in the world. That's stocks, bonds, cash, four hundred and fifty trillion dollars. 
that's in a burning house, right? Because the governments are out of control. They're going to print the shit out of it, right? And so there's what? A little over 1 trillion of Bitcoin, 1.1, something like that of Bitcoin. There's about, what everyone says there's 10 trillion of gold. There's really not 10 trillion of tradable gold because a lot of it's around women's, you know, necks in, in India and, and also in, you know, museums and so on and so forth. So there's really about five or six trillion of tradable gold, bullions and coins. And then there's about 1 trillion of tradable gold stocks. So, so, you know, let's say there's maybe $8 trillion of these sound money alternatives, you know, and there's 450 trillion of fiat nonsense. I mean, you think when that 450 realizes that it's in a burning house, that it's not going to come after both of these things like a mother. I mean, it's just going to, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there are going to be people, I mean, you think the Indians are going to, or the Chinese are going to chase Bitcoin. Some smart ones will, but plenty of them won't, you know, the boomers, I know a lot of boomers. I have a lot of boomer clients I've been working on for years and, I mean, I view my role as trying to orange pill these guys and some of them just aren't going to get it, but they, you know, but they're going to get gold. And, and guess what? In fiat terms, that gold's going to do OK, not as well as Bitcoin, but OK. I mean, if some people are saying, well, this gold is, you know, gold's going to get demonetized. It's going to go down. It's gonna, or I think I remember hearing somebody saying, might have been Sailor. Did he say gold was going to zero? I mean, you know, perhaps over some longer time frame, gold, you know, goes down on a, on a fiat basis from today's level. But it's been incredibly suppressed. I mean, it has been demonetized. You know, if you use the 1971 calculations, which, you know, gold should be fifteen dollars or $20,000 right now. So, and, and everyone says, well, you can take the monetary premium out of it. You know, it's going to be just left for jewelry. Hell, you're already there. I mean, the average cost of mine an ounce of gold is about thirteen. Well, it was $1,100, but it's closer to $1,300. I mean, we're not going to have any new gold. If gold falls in price from here, there's not going to be, gold mines are going to shut down. So... So you know, why is that an argument for holding gold? That's that's a strong argument for holding uh, Bitcoin. How how does Bitcoin resist that kind of demonetization uh, that you know governments imposed on on gold? Well, well, we'll get to that in a minute. I mean, Bitcoin. If if the futures market in Bitcoin becomes as large or larger than the underlying chain, then there's going to be a problem, and because that's how they've done it in in, uh, in gold. They've done it by creating synthetic paper gold and 300 claims plus for every ounce that's in existence. Okay. And they did it at a government level. They did it at the BIS level. They did it with the exchange stabilization fund level. That's how they held it down in these numbers, you know, but there's a chance that this gold, you know, that this, this suppression will eventually crack. And if, and when it does, you know, as Luke Roman says, you know, gold may only reset once in your lifetime, but once might be enough. I mean, by, by the math that I figured out, gold should be, be between twenty and thirty thousand dollars an ounce. So I don't mind holding something like that. Um, you know, that's that undervalued compared to what it should be if you had it if you had it as, as one of the and, and Brady, it's really important to understand how institutional investors work and the allocations that they make to uh, fund managers. Okay. So it's just, you know, I, I need to hit a couple of points here. Uh, Larry, uh, excellent argument. I, I just I, I need to remind you I'm a debt guy. And you're looking at it as market value uh, or you're netting out debt, total addressable assets, financial assets in the world, including debt, not netting out debt, are 900 trillion. Okay. okay. So just take your numbers and double them because right. that's what happens <laughs> when you look at enterprise value rather than, uh, you know, uh, an equity analyst type of view. So always look at enterprise value. The enterprise value of the financial system is 900 trillion. Just double your math. So you double your price target in Bitcoin and right. your gold price target, by the way. Right. But here, here's what I need to point out. A couple of things here. Portfolio allocation for institutional investors. They're still in the dark ages. They, it, you know, we talk about their traditional 60, 40 allocation, but then you get some really progressive guys like CalPERS that says, okay, well, I'm actually going to use leverage on the 60, 40 portfolio to enhance my returns. Like what could possibly go wrong there, right? Uh, CalPERS. They need to enhance their returns because their uh, their assumed rate uh, to pay their pension plan of eight percent is impossible to achieve without levering up uh, and making more risky their investments. Okay, you can't get sixty forty when bonds ten year bonds are at one and a half percent. Okay, let's just rewrite mathematics. No, you're not going to do that. So the reality is, <clears throat> excuse me, that a an institutional allocation to Bitcoin and to gold probably come out of a similar uh, silo, if you will. And that's why Larry is uh, trying to bring along and educate these dinosaurs in the pension world. I saw some comments go, go by that said, 
vol doesn't, you know, volatility doesn't hurt me or it doesn't bother me. Okay, listen, you're not managing trillions of dollars of hedge fund money, excuse me, of pension fund money. It bothers them. Even though it's wrong, they measure risk by volatility. Yes. Now, let me just make sure everyone understands math. This is volatility. This line going from the top left of my screen, I'm not sure. Okay. Imagine I'm doing this properly. Top left to the bottom right with absolutely no volatility in it has zero volatility, but you've lost all your money. Well, no risk, no volatility, but went from the top right to the bottom left. Wake up, you idiot fucking pension allocators. <laughs> Learn some fucking math, okay? <laughs> this is disgraceful, the way you measure risk. As Bill Miller says, rightly, volatility is the price of return. So right. full stop. Volatility is the price of return. And just because a line goes straight down to the left and eventually goes to zero with no volatility does not mean you have no risk. Okay, let's look more at what a true portfolio allocation is. We're trying to get these guys off of zero. And Larry is out there doing great work. Why? Because they have always thought of, he of, of gold as being their fiat hedge. And Bitcoin just has to, happens to be a superior horse in the race. And this is really important. Larry was in New Orleans and gave a speech to the New, Engl the New Orleans Gold conference, I guess, Larry, you correct yes, me. Look, yeah, the gold conference. Okay. Gold and, conference. and by the way, it was friggin' awesome. And you cannot, I, I love Michael Saylor. You know, I guys know that I, I got swallowed up in his vortex when we were on a Twitter spaces together. The guy is brilliant. He's a walking mainframe computer. He's also <laughs> got balls the size of a fucking gorilla. Okay. <laughs> and these pension allocators are not gorillas. You know what they are? They're tight little fucking sphincters that walk around and say, I don't want to take any risk because my job depends on me. If Calper says do it this way, then I'm going to do it this way because I'm the Pennsylvania Retirement Income Fund. And then Canada's CPPIB is going to look at Calpers and say, do it this way. It's coming, people, but you don't orange pill somebody to go from zero to 100%. It just doesn't work that way. Now, I'm not saying don't manage your own portfolio that way. I don't manage my portfolio that way, but I hope you don't take issue with me as being a Bitcoin maxi. I'm a Bitcoin maxi. I try not to be toxic, but guess what? I do own other assets as well. Yeah. I, it's just the way I, I work. And, and so Lawrence, is, he's on our team, okay? He's on our team. He, we're rowing in the same, same direction. $10 trillion out of $900 trillion dollars is a rounding error. If we're focusing on the crumbs, you're missing the big stack of bread, the loaf, the big pieces right. of slice, okay? And right. that's what we're going after. Yeah, the whole, the whole notion that gold, that Bitcoiners need gold to fail or that Bitcoin is the enemy, you know, it's it just, that's, in my opinion, that's, they're being short-sighted even to themselves because the gold people are the most natural and easy converts. Once gold people really understand this, they, they, they adopt it, I've adopted it. If you're smart and you do the math and you do the work, you come to the conclusion that Bitcoin's going to win. I mean, it's it's clear. You know that that's not hard to do. I mean, I was at this gold show and we asked the question. I mean, these are everyone there. The average age there is probably sixty or seventy. You know, and, and so you know, they asked the question. How many of you guys? So they all own gold. You can be sure of that. How many of you guys own Bitcoin? Half the hands went up. They totally get it. I mean, you know, it's 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 happening, but um, you know, it, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not happening in an instant. And some people, you know, are going to be slow in adopting it. Right. And so that's fine. I mean, it, you know, let them I be say, slow. here's the neat thing. And Larry, this is cool. So already I'm a bear now. So I'm a bear foss going across. Look guys. Okay. I love you guys to death. I love you guys. Even my worst <laughs> enemies on Bitcoin Twitter. I still love you. You got to read research that's counter to your thesis. Okay. If you can guarantee me that Bitcoin's going to my price target, which is 2 million bucks US per Bitcoin, then I'm going to be all in. Okay. Just guarantee me that. And I promise you, I'm going to put all my money in Bitcoin. But until then, go fuck off. Okay. You've never managed money. I'm, if I'm a bear, bear foss, then you can, I, I won't even go any further. I've probably, it's going uh, higher than you, that, right? it's going, I, it's I know going. you are. Why am I so bearish? It has to go through 2 million first though. It has to, doesn't it, Larry? That's just the way the world works. And once the information changes, then I'll adjust my price target. 
It's a target, not a limit, you fucking losers. Okay? <laughs> I've had it with this. I am not a bear. I'm a realist in terms of managing risk. Right now, it's a rounding error. It's a rounding error, and you all are overthinking this, but it's still got to go through 100000 before it gets to my price target. And if my price target's too low, so be it. I'll change my target when the information changes. And this is really important. Sailor started by dissing Bitcoin in 2013, didn't he, Larry? I don't he remember said Bitcoin. Oh, sir, he yeah. did. Bitcoin I, he was did. going to zero. Bit now, the good thing about Sailor is he actually learned to change his mind. He's not an idiot like Peter Schiff, okay? Right. The right. good thing is he changed his mind. And I applaud you. And I hope that Michael Saylor and I will sit down and have that one-on-one -on -one together that we said we would. I have no issue with him having balls the size of a gorilla. It's just you're not going to attract the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board by saying, you know what, Canada? Now it's time to go 100% in. It just doesn't work that way. Right. Well, the other thing is, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, you always catch, you attract more bees with honey than, you know, you attract more bees with honey than with vinegar. I mean, it's, you know, again, the, 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 the toxic maxis, I think, you know, the, the have fun staying poor and, you know, not going to make it and all that stuff. I mean, okay, fine. But, you know, if you're really trying to help people, you know, I, I think we should be explaining it to them and, and we shouldn't just because people don't get it. I mean, everybody comes to this slowly and, you know, everyone starts slowly and eventually you get more and more orange pilled, right? I mean, you, you come to understand it better and then your allocations go up. Of course, the price goes up. That helps your weighting go up. And, you know, you, you see what is is certainly probably inevitable. But, you know, it's to, to, to suggest, I mean, in my view, to kind of suggest that if you're not 100 percent all in and pounding the table and, and willing, you know, I, I mean, I have some people send me DMs, you know, you're not my friend, you're my enemy. You know, you hold that alternative <laughs> asset. And I'm just like, to me, that just indicates enormous insecurity on their part. Right. Um, you know, so, if, if, the good thing so is, how, Lawrence, why, why do they feel like they have to try and pound it into my skull? I mean, AKS, I'm cool. I'm AKS, AKS you know? seven, uh, four S guaranteed me that Bitcoin's going to my price target of 2 million. So I'd like to buy insurance on that, uh, AKS seven, four S please tell me where I buy insurance on your policy that guarantees me that it goes there. Yeah. And then I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to know. I, you know okay? honestly, I think it's going much higher than 2 million. I do. It's going through 2 million first though, Larry. It's the way it works. It's the way it works. The way it works. I mean, you know, to me, the thing that's most interesting about Bitcoin, one thing I learned, I'm a professional money manager. One thing I learned in this last cycle was the, the, the value of networks and how much they grow. And I'd just like to give you an anecdote. I, I was looking at Google and I was looking at Facebook and I was looking at Amazon as they were growing in the early, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012. And I could never get there. You know, I just couldn't get there based on the price. I thought these things, yeah, they're good businesses, but they're just overvalued, period, full stop. I'm not going to buy them. What a mistake, because what I didn't fully understand with Metcalf's law and the way that a network just sucks everything in its wake into it, and, and it doesn't grow in a regular historic, you know, the way we were taught to analyze stocks and stock growth, it, you know, it grows exponentially. And, and so I did see that the first time I saw that actually was in the internet and I got that. I invested heavily in the internet in 93, four and five, but I didn't get it with the internet apps on top of it. And now, but now I see the same thing happening again in Bitcoin and it's, it's a monster. And that's what I said in my speech, it's a monetary monster and it's gonna eat the world. But, you know, meanwhile, you know, we've got a lot of people who don't even understand that, you know, unsound money is the underlying problem. And, and so, you know, so we gotta, we gotta get them hooked on marijuana first, you know, and then, then, we'll, <laughs> then, we'll, take them, then we'll take them into heroin. You know, that's it. A great, great analogy. And uh, I'm not <laughs> sure how this works. Uh, Brady is uh, there's that question on the side there from Brecky. And I think it's something that we. Definitely oh, yeah, this actually came from this actually came from X Factor. Um, let me see if I can find it again. Who is is it true that futures ETFs? There were a couple questions about this, actually. And it's a good a good question because a lot of people seem to have it. Um, is it true that the futures ETF serves to suppress the price of Bitcoin? So I, I'd like to address that first and then uh, and then yeah. uh, understand that uh, Larry has experience here, too. And I want to so there's a, some some good good old ribbing going on in the comments on the right hand side of the screen where, you know, uh, they're take they're either all in. It either goes to zero or they're going to be a multi-billionaire. And that's all good, too. Like if people can manage their lives by being, uh, uh, you know, it, absolutely binary outcomes that's okay i'll assure you that pension managers don't do that i just want everyone to understand the mathematics that goes into a probability analysis of allocating capital 
to a risk adjusted trade. Okay. When you are laying out probabilities, let's start with my probability where I think it, my target for Bitcoin is $2 million. And we're only going to have a binary outcome. It can either be 2 million or it can be zero. The question then is what is the probability that the market is telling me that Bitcoin can reach 2 million? And you back out a probability of 3%, right? Because in today's dollars, 3% times 2 million is 60,000. And 97% times zero is zero, which means the expected value of that binary outcome, binary means only two outcomes when in reality, it's a continuous distribution of outcomes. You can back out the probability that the market is saying, there's only a 3% chance that FOSS is right. And I'm going to say, well, those are stupid odds. My odds are way higher. It's not 100% though, but they're certainly way higher than what the market is telling me. Yes. So therefore, I'm a buyer at this price. Right. And I'll be a buyer right up until where it hits my expected value. And right now, I would say it's a 40, 40% 40 chance it hits my price target. And other guys out there can be 100% certain. And I'm not saying you're wrong and I'm right. I'm just saying you are telling me that Bitcoin today should be trading at $2 million then. If you're 100% certain it's going to $2 million in today's dollars, then it should be right at $2 million today. But yeah. the market's saying 3% only, 3% chance. It's going to the racetrack. It's figuring out that you've watched this pony train and you know the pony is an exceptional race racer and the racetrack is laying 100 to 1 odds against your horse. What do you do? You go to the window, Larry, and you say, my pony to win, right. my that. pony to win. I'll and you it. buy it until the odds come down to where you are comfortable. Let's address, let's address the futures market and the manipulation. Because I see a lot of the comments going by on that. So, and I can talk about how it happened in the gold because I've watched it and studied it in great depth. Um, so, you know, first of all, yes, you've got a chain. You can see all the coins on the chain. You can see the records. Uh, and it's going to be hard to borrow Bitcoin and, and short it. And, and that's what would be required, you know, if you were kind of quote unquote shorting it on the chain. But you'd almost be sure to get wrecked in that instance because any asset that can go up 500% in six months like it just did, you know, you're going to get blown out of that short position. So so that's not really, I mean, it, it has the beauty of you can actually see it. And, you know, we don't know how much gold is in Fort Knox and we don't know, you know, who has what amount of gold. I mean, this gold's very opaque and it's controlled by the banks and the banks are corrupt and blah, blah, blah. So, so a lot of problems with knowing what the gold is and where it is. And Bitcoin solves some of those. But not all of them. There's one big hole in this in this equation, and that is the futures market. And you can create, you can sell, not having Bitcoin, you can sell a futures contract on the price of Bitcoin. And guess what? You know, the, the, the spot price is going to somewhat reflect the futures price. It may not perfectly reflect one another, but, you know, arbitrageurs will get in there unless they, you know, assuming they don't think that the futures market is fraudulent to arb away any su substantial differences. And if, if a lot of paper Bitcoin gets created in the same way that a lot of paper gold gets got created, it would be, you know, in other words, if the, if the U.S. government or all the governments of the world decided we are going to create an enormous futures market in Bitcoin. And anytime we see the price go somewhere we don't like, we're going to sell unbacked futures. And you might say, where do they get the money to do it? Well, I'll tell you where they get the money to do it. They print it and they can keep it off balance sheet and they can do it as a matter of national security which is what they've done in the gold market. They know, they, you know, Summers and Barsky wrote a paper called Gibson's Paradox, which laid out very clearly the way, and Robert Rubin was involved, the way that keeping interest rates low in a growing and expansionary climate and with, with inflation was the key to success. It's what got Bill Clinton reelected. And it's why James Carville said, you know, you mean to tell me we're gonna have to live and die at the, at the whim of the bond market? But they figured out how to rig the gold price because the gold price was the, the canary in the coal mine that said we've got real inflation. And so they started creating paper gold. And that's how the gold price has gotten so far away from where it really should be. If we use the 1971 calculation, the gold price should be $25,000 an ounce. Why isn't it? Because every time it went up, the government would sell some. You said, well, that's a losing strategy. The price of gold has been going up. Well, it is a losing strategy. But if you're not reporting your P&L and you can print money to cover your losses, is it really a losing strategy? I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a case. I mean, Luke Groman, is the, I give him credit for pointing this out to me. It's a case of table stakes poker where the central banks and the governments are the biggest player at the table. If you, and anyone who's played table stakes poker knows 
that if one guy is sitting there with more money than everybody else in the room, he can bluff a hand and he's, and nobody can call him. And that's what we're talking about, paper gold. That's what they've done to gold. And by the way, there's nothing that says they can't ultimately try and do it to Bitcoin. The good news is we could probably see the paper Bitcoin contracts and we will probably know. And, you know, maybe, maybe politically people will push very hard to dig into the, audit, into the Fed and the exchange stabilization fund and to unmask that kind of manipulation if it does occur. But I think Bitcoiners are being somewhat naive if they think it's not a possibility because it is. 100% agree, Larry. That was beautiful. And I just want to address uh, Crypto Jado's uh, 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 comment that Bitcoin price is derived from spot exchanges, not futures markets. Absolutely wrong. All inputs, all markets, all supply and demand goes into pricing the underlying. Okay? You need to understand what Larry just said. You need to hold people accountable if this happens. And we have a beautiful ledger that's on chain, but you don't have the cash settled futures on chain. Can they print money to suppress the price of Bitcoin? Absolutely. Is it a risk? Absolutely. Would it be a trade I'd ever do? I'd actually want to go on the other side. I would want to embrace this beautiful thing called a store of value. I would want the USA to take this gift that China has provided us, the West, and run with a dual platform where you have global reserve currency called the US dollar, good for barter, good for uh, international trade. And then you have a store of value Bitcoin that you control domestically with miners and nodes. And guess what? Rich people and people who are going to get rich embracing this beautiful technology. I hate to say it, the US is the most powerful financial markets in the world. Prices globally are set out of New York City generally. Anything that happens when New York City is closed is generally done by fools, okay? And New York regularly takes advantage of these fools. Chicago, New York, same sort of thing. One is cash, one is derivatives. It doesn't matter. Yes, the futures markets matter. Again, I'd rather get the government on our side embracing this beautiful technology for storing value while at the same time maintaining a fiat currency. Bitcoin, reserve, world reserve asset, US dollar fiat, world reserve currency that's going to debase go to zero go under zero i don't care it's gone there historically and it will continue to go there the thing we need to do is embrace it not fight it are there people that want to fight bitcoin yeah we know who they are hopefully this occ office of the controller of the currency gets called out for her lame ass interpretations of well the fed should be able to short stocks Tell me, if you're going to short stocks to control the price of stocks in her mind, do you think she'd stop for one minute flooding the futures markets in Bitcoin to suppress and actually depreciate the value of Bitcoin to accomplish some goals? Please, people, take the green eye shade off, okay? Live in the real world. All right, Foss. Yes, sir. Do you really think that we can have a dual currency system, a dual money system like that? Jeff, if you Booth, have, and I, Jeff Booth and I do. Michael Saylor and I, I do. I'm not I saying know, but right. I, but in my yeah. mind, I've, I've rationalized that as strategic uh, rhetoric, right? To sort of calm the, you know, the fears of the government. I don't see how there could be a... I understand that the U.S. will enforce or would enforce the the U.S. dollar around the world continue to. But if countries have a, a, an opt out, right, that is not controlled by a central government or by a global power, they're going to start taking that. And then the citizens in those countries right. are going to start trading in Bitcoin on a cash layer like lightning. And that's just going to spread around the world. Money goes to one. I mean, I saw you tweet that, you know, yeah. just OK. So, Brady, it's a network transfer. And when you're doing a network transfer, you don't turn one network off and start the other. No, I get that. Yeah, okay. it's a transition phase. This is a process, phase. guys. It's a process. There's 180 countries around the world. All of their dollars and currencies will fail before the U.S. dollar fails. Sure. 
I agree with we that. We got to stop living in this US dollar paradox. We got to, we're not myopic, okay? Canada is on their way to failing. Canada could very well fail in my lifetime. Very, very unlikely that the US dollar will fail in my lifetime. But unfortunately, I live in Canada and Canada is a G7 nation. We just have just about as the stupidest politician running our com- our country that was ever invented. But that's one of the risks. OK, so we need a parallel system. We don't turn off one system and immediately embrace another one. It's a process and it's a process primarily, Brady. And this is really important for the other like bottom 150 countries in the world. That's where the real adoption and the real benefit yeah. takes place. And those yeah. people will adopt the US dollar as their fiat, not their local dollar, the US dollar. And then they'll adopt Bitcoin as their store of value. Mm. And it's just a process of working out of the current, everyone's printing fiat dollars. And you know that Argentina has defaulted four times in my life, right? Four. Which means there's never been a 30-year bond from Argentina that's actually matured in my lifetime. They just defaulted. So is that going to happen to the U.S. Treasury? Someday the U.S. Treasury bond auction will be so putrid that even Rick Santelli will turn his television screen off and say, this wasn't a dog minus, because that's what he calls a D minus auction, a dog minus. This was a complete and fucking failure. And guess what? There ain't no bond market left. And when that happens... You better have a backup network, okay? Because yeah. it will happen. Do, yeah, and Greg, I'll actually take the other side of you saying there will always be a dollar and the dollar will always live. I think the dollar is going to completely fail. I see a comment here that says no reserve currency has ever failed. Well, it, the Roman denarius has completely failed, and that was the reserve currency at the time. Um, I, I believe that we are actually going to see a full-out failure of the existing currency system. Uh, it's going to be driven by Gresham's Law. And uh, as a result of that, um, you know, they're going to have to do some kind of a reset. Now, there may be a new dollar, maybe 10 old dollars for a new dollar. And as you pointed out, Greg, there, we will, as we all know, we will have to go to a new neutral reserve currency and the candidates are gold and Bitcoin. And obviously, if the U.S. chooses Bitcoin, it's strategically much more intelligent than choosing gold um, because we, we, you know, we can, um, you know, we can basically be very strong in Bitcoin. And in fact, we probably don't have the gold we say we have. And we know that China, India and Russia, all three corrupt corrupt companies, countries, although we're somewhat corrupt as well, uh, we know they have a ton of gold. And so Bitcoin would be the smart choice. But the, the problem that they've got is that they've got a mathematically unsound system where the debts are growing faster than the underlying productivity. And, you know, we're living in a world where, you know, Keynesians have kind of convinced everybody that you got to have growth, um, you know, to, to have a successful economy. And the, the, the notion of unlimited growth in a, in a resource constrained world, the two just don't foot. I mean, you know, we, we could we could basically destroy the world by continuing to grow um, and, and nobody wants to do that. And nobody should do that. And and the system is now at the state at which it's going to come unraveled, in my opinion. And I think it's probably going to come unraveled in the next five years. Well, then we need insurance, right, Larry? We need oh, insurance. That's, right. that's that's my whole argument here. Look, that's I hope I exactly hope right. honest to God, I hope you're wrong. And I, 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 I it's going to be ugly, right? I, but, ne- I need yeah. people to understand they better be careful what they're hoping for. Okay. Oh, I've yeah. sat in that chair in 19, uh, sorry, in, well, I've sat in the first financial crisis of my life in 1988. Okay. The worst one was 2008, 2009. It was over. It was over. Yeah. There yeah. was no bid for anything, anything. And if you got the margin clerk tapping you on the so- shoulder saying uh, the clients want their money back, you're like, how the heck do I sell? Even if you're on great trades, like we were positioning, we were making a ton of money. We were well positioned. And guess what? We were still getting redeemed because people wanted their capital back. And all of a sudden you're like, well, I can't even unwind a profitable trade on a mark to market basis. Things are moving so quickly. Bond prices were moving 25 points on a trade. Now, well, mind you, these were high yield corporate. Slowly and then all at once, right? There you go, brother. Look, when, when the confidence is lost here, there will be no bid for the dollar, and that's hyperinflation. And I don't care if it's a reserve currency or not. I mean, once people come to realize the math, which says that they cannot keep this system going without printing more and more forever, I mean, the next thing to fail is going to be the bond market, and then yield curve control is going to come in. The next thing you know, you're going to have a treasury, you know, you're going to have a, a Fed balance sheet of $30 trillion. And eventually, everyone's going to wake up and say, you know what? These guys can't ever stop. They're, it's just impossible for them yeah. to stop. And so then everyone's going to go to what's an alternative, and they're going to say, give me sound stuff. 
You know, and that's that's how it happened in Weimar. Give me stuff. You, Give me, you're totally me right, stuff buddy. Right now. Yeah. And, and this is this is well, sorry to jump on top of you. That. You don't want it to happen though. Let's be honest. No, you don't want that, no, right? No, and this is why we need yeah. to help people make the educated choice that Bitcoin solves so many things. Okay. Right. And it it solves it's it's a beautiful insurance policy until it becomes the standard. But you know, people who have failed math, they haven't done the debt spiral mathematics. Larry, you've done it. It's impossible to escape, achieve escape velocity out of this debt spiral. Grade 11 math, that's what I always say. Don't overthink this, but the government still has a lot of bullets. And the difference is, and these are, you know, fiat bullets. Unfortunately, it still works. And there's a lot of uneducated people out there that want it. Oh, yeah, modern monetary theory. It says, you know, here in my textbook, it says your textbook ain't worth shit. Okay, sit in a risk chair. Understand it when the world is unraveling. There ain't no present value calculations. There ain't no interest rates. It's get me my fucking money, clown, or you have to gate (laughs) your fund. And when you gate your fund, you are out of business, okay? Because people will never give you money again if you gate your fund. And for all those really good risk managers out there, what does gate your fund mean? It just means you can't have your money back. So who in God's green earth are going to give you money again if the last time you managed their money, you said you can't have it back? Those are real life situations. And we were crushing it. And we were being redeemed because people just wanted their money back. Wow. Very, very tough to sit in a wrist chair, Stephanie Kelton. Get yourself out of your <laughs> armchair fucking endowed seat and do some research, you sweet ass. Anyway, I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> cut him off. Cut him off. Uh, all right. Well, Larry's got a meeting here in about 10 minutes, and I wanted to riff, re- ask you guys to riff on a little bit bigger picture uh, thinking here. And we're sort of moving in that direction anyway. Um let's talk about the moral and social implications of fiat and inflation and then Bitcoin. Um, So Larry has said that fiat is a matter of life and death for our children. Uh, Greg has said fiat is slave coin. And these are big moral claims. And I'd love to hear you guys talk about your reasoning that arrived at, um, at these big claims. Uh, Larry, you want to start? Yeah, I'll go first. I mean, I, people should watch my New Orleans conference show because of uh, speech, because I talk about this a lot. I mean, I don't think there's anybody listening to this call or anyone really in the, co- in the countries we all live in that would agree that theft is okay. You know, everyone, um, property rights are part of Western civilization. And um, what the government does to us and the way they run the monetary system is they steal from us on a regular basis. And that seems to be okay to them. And they do it by diluting the, the currency. And so they're stealing our time and our labor and our savings. And it's, it's evil. I mean, it prevents people from retiring. Uh, it, you know, they, they, the people who are able to borrow this cheap money at first become cotillionaires because they get the advantage of it. Um, you know, they, we all pay for it by inflation the inflation is completely distorted and and so forth and you know it's it's if you have corrupt money it leads to a corrupt society and you know i mean the you know the bible said this i mean honest weights and measures i mean the you know our constitution said this only gold and silver are money because they lived through the hyperinflation of of um of the continental and uh you know it, it's corrupt money leads to a corrupt society and that's you know and it, and there are a thousand you know, pieces of evidence to support that, but we don't have time to go into them all now here. I, I suggest people listen to my speech because I, I mentioned some of them there. And it was an amazing speech. I'll concur. And I, you know, Larry uh, says it eloquently. He says it from someone who sat in a risk chair for longer than I have. I mean, I only started managing money in 1988. Larry, I don't know. You were probably a couple of years yeah, earlier than yeah, that, 83. right? All right. So here's the truth. When we started managing money in 1983, you did. And I started sort of trading markets, I'll be honest, in 1983. Um, <laughs> that uh, interest rates, U.S. Treasury tenure was uh, close to uh, 16, one six percent. OK, I remember one that. six. OK, that's when these brilliant pension allocators made a decision that 60 percent stock and 40 percent bonds, you could reach uh, a, a uh, 
targeted return that would satisfy your uh, your auditors, your your uh, pension auditors, that your that your uh, pension liabilities were fully funded. This is a big issue, right? Fully funded pension plans. You mentioned that the Fed balance sheet will be thirty trillion, Larry. You're about one seventh of the way. It'll have to be two hundred trillion because all of these Medicare and Medicaid expenses, which is a hundred and sixty trillion. People are yeah. counting on this stuff. Yeah. Guys, it's one, it's mathematics. There's called on balance sheet obligations and off balance sheet obligations. Okay. So you got 160 trillion in today's dollars that aren't ever going to get paid. You better understand mathematics, but let's go back one level up. Why is Bitcoin freedom money? And why is fiat slave money? Well, very simply, when you continue to print dollars or any fiat for that matter, the people that at least have a chance of keeping up with this inflation or the debasing that happens with the fiat money is the people that own hard assets. So everyone's today like saying, oh, I'm making so much money on my house. My house is going up in dollar in, in value. And, and the answer to that is absolutely wrong. You just failed math. OK, it's not that your house price is going up in value. It's that the unit of account called a debasing U.S. dollar is going down and therefore it takes more uh, of this us dollar to buy the same house if you measured house prices in gold if you measured equity returns in gold over the last 20 years you would see that the returns are basically flat all right bitcoin makes all of those calculations moot but again bitcoin's only 12 years old this is a process of educating people but again the people that get protected are the privileged the top call it three percent the people that get hurt the most are the people at the bottom of the privilege spectrum. The people that keep, that live week to week, uh, you know, they might have $10,000 in savings. I'll tell you what blew my mind when I was down in, uh, in Miami. First thing that blew my mind, it cost $4.25 US for a Coke Zero, which when you convert that to Canadian, it's over five bucks, all right? When Coke Zero first came out, I was buying those things for less than $1 Canadian, all right? That's in my lifetime. Second and more importantly, uh, my bag got actually misplaced, let's put it that way, on my way back to the airport. And wouldn't you know that my flight back home got canceled, so I had to buy a to toiletry kit, kit. This one shop wanted $18 for a thing of deodorant. 18 bucks. For a thing of deodorant, that's not that the value of deodorant has gone up that much. Although sitting next to me might mean that, yeah, you need $18 worth of deodorant, Foss. But at the end of the fucking day, $18 for deodorant is only because the value of the U.S. dollar has gone down that much. The U.S. dollar does not stop stinky armpits, okay? Fuck, guys, do some math, okay? And the people it hurts the most are the people at the bottom of the spectrum. That's why fiat is slave money. You are a slave to this ever increasing price of deodorant and a price of Coca-Cola. This is really, really serious. I have three children. I want a future for them. Like I was lucky enough to grow up in Larry. I think you would say the same thing. Absolutely. We can have this parallel system. I don't think five years is enough for us to develop this parallel system. Could, could the U S dollar fail in five years? Oh my friggin' Lord, it could. And then what? It means that the Canadian dollar's failing tomorrow, which even makes me really scared, okay? Because there's no way that the US dollar fails five years after the Canadian dollar fails. The Canadian dollar failure will be the first precursor to this. So you can hope that Canada fails, to which I'll say, fuck you guys, okay? Canada used to be a great nation if our politicians embraced Bitcoin and took our energy and started to be the El Salvador of the North, I'd be so proud. And we're working hard on that. I gave a presentation to 45 members of parliament. Okay. Not all of them are brain dead, like the ruling parties in both of our countries. Please people, this is hope. Bitcoin is hope. Bitcoin is freedom money. Fiat is slave money. And the USA was built on the principles of freedom. Yeah, that's true. And the practices of slavery. <laughs> Ooh, that <laughs> sort of stings. But uh, yeah, yeah, true that. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm with you guys. You know, I'm a dad of two, and uh, was pretty hopeless before I found Bitcoin. Started understanding how things were going, and 
and uh, on the older end of the millennial spectrum and, and, you know, millennial generation has really gotten the shaft uh, in, in financially speaking, uh, you know, poorer than uh, first, I, I think the first generation, in, you know, hundred years plus uh, that has been uh, worse off financially speaking than their parents. And uh, not only that, but also on the privacy front, for instance, I thought we were headed toward a world of radical transparency and our kids would never know a world where they could have a private life. Um, and, and Bitcoin has given promise on both of those fronts, which I think are extremely important and are going to change the way the world lives and, and works over the next 100 years. So I'm right there alongside you guys. And we're here fighting that good fight because we do believe that. I mean, this is a, 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 a world, a, a space full of mission driven people who are working in their spare time. Uh, and also increasingly in the Bitcoin only industry, which is sort of the dream for Bitcoiners is to get a job in this growing industry. So keep doing, you know, everyone who's listening, keep doing what you're doing, you know, post on Twitter, write uh, newsletters, blog posts, do analysis, make shows, uh, network, go to these events, get to know other people and, uh, you know, join this very quickly growing Bitcoin only industry. Um, so this is, uh, this is where it's going. Next 10 years are going to be amazing. I would completely agree. Uh, I, I work hard to try and orange pill absolutely everybody I come in contact with because I think that's how we're going to do it. I mean, we just got to drain the swamp. And, you know, as I said in my speech, I mean, buy Bitcoin, buy gold, buy silver. Don't play the fiat game. Get out of their game and borrow in fiat because it's going to be worthless anyway. You know, as long as you know you got the note covered, you're not going to get the asset taken away from you. I mean, one of the greatest gifts out there, and of course, you see people taking advantage of it. Is, you know, you can buy a house, which is a real asset, right? And, you know, for 3%, 30-year money, well, damn, in this environment, that's a hell of a good deal, you know, because, you, I mean, the houses in the U.S. are going up 15 to 20% a year. You can borrow that with 3% money. I mean, if you know your, your income stream is secure and there's no chance of losing that asset in a downturn or a depression, then, you know, have at it. Um, I completely, you know, I think it's a very important thing to consider doing. I met so many great uh, people in Miami this weekend. Uh, they weren't Bitcoin maxis. Some of them were. Some of them were just people concerned about the future. Uh, listen, uh, the greatest thing about America, it's still the country we need to succeed because freedom of speech and uh, freedom of opinion are written in the Constitution. Uh, I, as you know, I'm a proud Canadian, but I've lived and worked in the United States, uh, including having a uh, former college roommate who was killed in 9-11. Okay, I don't take this stuff lightly. Somebody out there, Sylvester, uh, Foss is so cringeworthy. Suvalaski Roy, come at me, buddy. Come at me, Suvalaski. Come at me, buddy. I'm, I dare you not to hide behind your little fucking avatar, okay? Suvalaski <laughs> Roy, you are cringeworthy. You know what you are. Come at me, man. You're despicable. Thank you so much, everyone else, though. You yeah. guys rock, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Honey and vinegar. Hey, it takes all. It takes all kinds, you know. Yeah. Uh, some people respond to to the Foss energy. Some people respond to the Larry energy. Yeah. Uh, you know, it goes both ways. Yeah. This. Uh, the, you know, one thing I will say though that uh, you know I have a lot of respect for people who are out there using their real name to advocate a point of view and uh, you know putting their ass on the line, whether they're right or wrong. Um, you know, these avatars and this, you know, from the cheap seats, I mean, uh, you know, Foss is a man in the ring. I'm a man in the ring. You know, we're, we're fighting. We're fighting a battle here that we think is very important. We're willing to take a stand. And, uh, you know, anyone who wants to criticize from the cheap seats, use your real name, you know, get out there and uh, have at it because uh, we've been we've been through a few fights and uh, we know what it takes. You know, if, if you haven't. If you haven't seen a serious drawdown, if you haven't, you know, I mean, I lived through the gold drawdown of uh, 2011 to 2015. It was brutal, but I knew sound money was the right place to be, and I stuck with it. I'm sure Foss has had similar experiences. I uh, just want to tell a quick story about my granddad, World War I fighter pilot, okay, uh, flying over Italy, has a German in his sights. Uh, the German points at his gun and says it's jammed, all right? It doesn't work. My granddad could have blown him out of the air. He goes, he points at the ground. He says, they fly down into a field. They land in Italy, okay, in a field. The German pilot jumps out of his plane with his pistol in the air, drops the pistol on the ground. My granddad runs over, picks the pistol up, goes to the front of the German fighter plane, rips the machine gun off of his plane, 
okay? Throws it in the back seat of his sop with camel, shakes hands with the German pilot and says, I'll kill you legitimately next time. I grew up in Montreal with a German machine gun from a World War I fighter plane in my basement. My granddad didn't fight that war for you fucking MMTers, okay? <laughs> I am telling you, you are a disgrace to freedom and proud people out there. That World War I uh, machine gun is now in the Canadian War Museum. We still own the, pi the fighter pilot's German pistol. And tell you what, okay? Real people fight real battles for what's right. And this is a fight for sound money. Well, and they and they use their real names, not some cowardly avatar. They put all themselves. right. I I, Amen. I do have to step. Amen. I do have to step in and, awesome. and you, rep, <laughs> represent the Nims for a second because, you know, it, I think it is important to have people who are using their real name and out here fighting the battles. I hundred percent agree with that, and I think it's important. But we also have Nims in this space, and it's really important to respect that privacy. Satoshi themselves, you know, were a Nim, and so when you are trying to disrupt. Uh, the global reserve currency or, or money, uh, I think you're going to need to, th therefore, you know, subverting the government, like, uh, you know, who was it, Hayek's, uh, Hayek's quote, you know, some by some sly roundabout way, yeah. um, you know, you've got to be a little sly, which which requires NIMS and, and, and privacy and cryptography yeah. in enough. this space. So just want to hear you just too. Well understand. said, well said, Brady Love. I got to run. I've got another. Yeah, Larry, don't, and I can All stay right. if you want. Brady, Larry, love you. Thank you for being on. I right. look forward to our Christmas meal, okay, in Boston. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank Thank you. God. Thanks Bye -bye. so much, Larry. Appreciate you, man. Bye. Do you want to move to spaces, uh, Brady, or do you uh, do you want to do it here? Yeah, let's move over to spaces. Okay, hold on. It's I will. I will do a couple it. of minutes. So, can you send me yeah. send me a, a a link or whatever? Yeah, Sam will send you a link in Twitter DMs. I'll do a okay. little sign off here, and then I'll meet okay. you over there in a few minutes. I'll be right there, buddy. Thank you. All right, thanks, man. Woo! What a show! <laughs> let's go. That was fun. I knew that one would be fire. Um, so we are. Uh, broadcasting this over on spaces or streaming it over on spaces as well uh, under the swan uh, Twitter handle, which is just at swan Bitcoin. So if you want to head over for the post game show on uh, Twitter spaces, you can head over there. Now there's maybe 150 plus people um, who have been listening over there and waiting to, uh, you know, mix it up with FOSS. So we'll be over there soon. Um, remember to go to, I was speaking about, you know, joining the Bitcoin only industry. If you go to bitcoinerjobs.co, bitcoinerjobs.co. You'll be able to uh, find all of the Bitcoin only companies uh, who are hiring on their open positions and be able to apply right there. Uh, it's really taken off. Uh, there's a, a lot of jobs posted there. So keep an eye on bitcoinerjobs.co and uh, get into the industry. And, and um, you know, it's, it's just it's a lot of fun and really uh, special to wake up every day and get to get to uh, work in the in this industry. So Keep an eye on that and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Go to swanbitcoin.com to start stacking. Go to swanbitcoin.com slash enlist, E-N-L-I-S-T, to grab your Swan Force referral link. Start uh, bringing in and orange pilling your friends and family, your coworkers. Uh, the holiday season's coming up. You're probably going to see a lot of your family and friends. It's a great time to start uh, you know, working on them and, and get paid to recruit those Bitcoiners. 25% uh, of Swan's fees for an entire year uh, on their purchases. Um, Swan Advisor Services just launched, swanbitcoin.com slash advisors. Uh, check that out if you are a financial advisor. If you're not, uh, then let your financial advisor know that you'd like to start stacking Bitcoin and you wanna do it with the best Bitcoin only company in the space, the first Bitcoin only uh, service for financial advisors. So refer Swan Financial or Swan Advisor Services to your financial advisors. And then if you're looking to make large purchases and uh, get uh, some great membership benefits, go to swanbitcoin.com slash private. Uh, Swan Private uh, is there to help you uh, on your journey to building generational wealth. So we'll wrap it up right there. Uh, thanks for being with us for episode 70, uh, working on another fire episode in a couple of weeks. Uh, in about a month, we're going to have the wrap up, uh, quarter the quarterly re report with Preston Pish and Andy Edstrom. Uh, that's going to be middle of December, and that happens four times a year and is always a fantastic show. So get over to Swan, uh, swansignalpodcast.com. You can subscribe to the audio or uh, you know make sure you subscribe to the channel here and to uh, the Swan Bitcoin Twitter handle where we're going to be doing spaces of these shows moving forward. All right, that's it. We'll see you over on Twitter. Take care.